everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Kenneth Adams. Um, happy to present another episode of Matters of the Heart presented by Haverhill Community TV and Pentucket Medical Associates. I'm happy to have Dr. Seth Bilizarian here today. And Dr. Bilizarian will be discussing the new atrial fibrillation guidelines. Great. Well, thank you again for that introduction and thanks for joining me. So we've done many episodes, or more than 100 Haverhill Community Television episodes, Matters of the Heart. Uh, many of them have talked about this problem that you and I are very familiar with, the most common irregular heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation. It's an irregular heart rhythm that increases with age. And we've done many programs, not only on atrial fibrillation, but on the different treatments for it. There are new blood thinning regimens. We've done, we've done individual shows on these. A lot of time has been spent because it's a big problem and a frequent problem and a common problem. So I want to talk about these new guidelines, and I want to talk a little bit about it. So. Uh, just for our audience, just to review. Guidelines are uh, strategies that are put together looking at all of the information by a group of experts from some societies. In this case, these guidelines are put together by three main societies, the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, and the Heart Rhythm Society. So those three organizations get together and they send experts and they sit around an oak table, I assume it's oak, and uh, they have this conversation to say, you know, what should we be telling community-based doctors like you and me who practice in the, f in the community and take care of patients, what's the best recommendations that we should be telling doctors to do for their patients? So these guidelines have been um, um, used to help us inform our patients, say, look, this is the current recommendation, the current guidelines. They're very cautious in the guidelines, which I'm very happy to say that they say that these guidelines are generally the best thing for most patients in most circumstances. And that's not meaning that's not for 100% of patients, it's for most patients. So given that situation, I was very excited to, to have this opportunity to talk with you about the guidelines and about updating it. So atrial fibrillation is the most common irregular heart rhythm, and this irregular heart rhythm issue is something that is uh, something that we see quite commonly. It's actually the second most common cause for heart Hot for hospital admission for heart problems, atrial fibrillation number one, another, sorry, number two, congested heart failure number one. So the guidelines have, have come out and they've helped us inform on a couple of things. One of the things that it helped us define is, is that the, there's a, a problem amongst atrial fibrillation. Most atrial fibrillation is caused by, um, not caused by heart valves. A small minority of, of atrial fibrillation is caused by heart valve problems. So we often refer to uh, uh, the, the majority of atrial fibrillation as non-valvular atrial fibrillation. But prior guidelines never really told us what that means. Does it mean a patient has a little bit of a heart valve problem or a moderate amount of heart valve problem? So these new guidelines helped us in that regard. They have told us non-valvular heart uh, atrial fibrillation means specifically a patient that doesn't have a problem with their mitral valve or have had a valve replaced. So other kinds of problems don't count for non-valvular, uh, don't count. So they, those are, if they don't have those particular kind of valvular problems, then it's not, uh, it can be considered non-valvular atrial fibrillation. The reason why that's important is that our new medications for blood thinning are only acceptable or indicated for non-valvular atrial fibrillation. So it was really important to know who fits into that category. So that was a really important, important I, I thing. I do have a question for you sure. on that. Because a lot of our patients, when we do echocardiograms, have a little bit of leakage across the mitral valve, mitral regurgitation. They might have a mild amount. Right. Should we consider them as people with valvular no. disease? According to these new guidelines, no. They, those patients would still, as you, as you just said, would be able to be considered non-valvular atrial fibrillation patients. The reason why it's important to make that distinguishing feature, as you know, is that if they do have valvular atrial fibrillation, we can't use the new drugs. We have to only limit our blood thinning options to the Coumadin or Warfarin. So that was, those are a couple of things. A, a third thing that was in our new guidelines is there's two kinds of atrial fibrillation, not really a kind of atrial fibrillation, but a, something that's a cousin of atrial fibrillation is called atrial flutter. And atrial flutter is a little bit different than atrial fibrillation in that it's a more organized heart rhythm. Atrial fibrillation is very chaotic, but atrial flutter is more organized. And the guidelines went out of their way to say we should really do our best to really see if it's atrial flutter because the treatment for atrial flutter is different than the treatment for atrial fibrillation in that there are really good catheter treatments to try to get rid of atrial flutter and, and help patients go back to normal rhythm and maybe not need the blood thinning type medications. So that was sort of a third recommendation that came in our new guidelines that atrial flutter really needs our attention to really identify it. And that, that, that identification can be made with an EKG. A fourth one, which I'd actually take a few minutes on, 
is that in the prior uh, shows, I've talked about how doctors like us mm -hmm. evaluate a patient for risk of a stroke. We've said in the past that atrial fibrillation has a couple of main problems. One is that the heart goes fast, but the most significant risk that we always worry about atrial fibrillation is that because the upper chamber is not contracting and emptying blood each beat, it's just wiggling, blood can clot inside of this like a stagnant pool of blood. And when a clot forms there, if it goes somewhere, we worry. And of course, the place we worry most about is the brain. That's a stroke. So atrial fibrillation has a risk of stroke. But everybody with atrial fibrillation does not have an equivalent risk of stroke. And we have a scoring system that we've talked about called the CHADS score. CHADS is C-H-A-D-S. And each letter stands for a medical problem that a patient might have. The C is for congestive heart failure. The H is for high blood pressure. The age is for age over 75, the D is for diabetes, and the S is for a prior stroke. So if you have any one of the first four of those, you get one point, and if you have a stroke, you get two points. So the reason why it's important is that we know that if you use this scoring system and you add up the points, the higher the number of points, the more risk of stroke there is. And generally what we say is if you have two of those points, you should definitely be on a blood thinner, definitely three, four, five as we go up. But Zero or one has been an area of uncl unclear sort of recommendation. Right. If you have a CHAD score of zero, so if you don't have congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, if you're less than 75 years old, if you don't have diabetes and you don't have a prior stroke and you have atrial fibrillation, you'd have a CHAD score of zero. We have been saying that it's okay not to be on a blood thinner. So the new guidelines have changed this. And previously, I've mentioned the score that the European cardiology community uses, and that's a score called the CHADS VASC score. It's the same score, but they've added a few extra points, four extra points, actually. And with this score, we will find more patients that might need anticoagulation. What the new guidelines in the United States now say is that if your patient has a CHAD score of two, you're done. They should be on blood thinners. But if they have a CHAD score of zero or one, we should really apply this CHADS VASC score. And what the CHADS VASC score is, those same things I mentioned, the CHADS, but the VASC is a little bit different. The V is for a prior history of vascular disease. So if you've had a heart attack or a stent or a bypass of an artery or a carotid surgery, some kind of arterial problem, that's a V, you get one point for that. The A is for age over 65. So they've lowered the age. The S is for uh, sex and that's for women. So if a woman is, is, she gets one point for being a woman. So those are the, the, the points for, for that. And um, the other A, the original CHADS A, age over 75, gets us two points. So there's a couple things that changed. They added a point for age over 75, and they added a point for between age 65 and 75. The practical issue for this for our patients is that if you're a woman over 65, you automatically have two points mm -hmm. because being a woman gets one point, and being over 65, you get one point. If you're over 75, you get a second point, so you'd have three. And what the new guidelines have said is that we should use the CHAD score. If you're zero or one, then we should use this other score. And if you're two on the CHADS VAS score, you should then get a blood thinning recommendation by us. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a really important discussion because we have to make people understand that just putting them on a blood thinner has its own risk. So that's why we want this score to determine is it better for them to be on a blood thinner or better not to be because blood thinners have their own risk of bleeding. Right. It's really, I agree with you completely, and it's a very complex decision for our patients because all things being equal, nobody wants to take a medicine. Nobody wants the expense of a medicine. Uh, so at what point does the risk get high enough that we should accept a risk of bleeding with a blood thinner? Because as you said, met these medicines, of course, they have cost, but the biggest thing we worry about is serious bleeding. Those serious bleeding rates are very low for most patients, but they do go up. Uh, as people get older and have other risk factors, and there are actually scores to help us say this patient's at higher risk. But I, I agree with you completely. It's a very complex decision, and, and the guidelines go out of their way to say that we should really use something called shared decision-making, which really is something maybe we can take a moment because I'd love to get your opinion on this. Shared decision-making is the basic concept that the doctor and the patient should collaborate. I, as a doctor, sitting, pretending you're the patient, would say, look, I, here's the recommendation. You have a certain number of scores based on this guideline. And the guidelines, the new guidelines, would recommend that you should be on a blood thinning medicine. And this is the potential cost. These are the potential hazards. What would you like to do? And I should really consider your values and make sure that you feel good about our recommendation and that we proceed after I really hear you out. 
I guess let me just ask this question and I'll tell you what you think. My experience trying to do shared decision making frequently ends up with the patient saying, what do you think I should do, doc? So what are your thoughts about that? They, they make a big point of emphasis about shared decision making. Of course, I think my thinking about shared decision making is it's like mom and apple pie. Mm -hmm. No one would be opposed to it, but on a practical level, these are very complex issues. And I think that even you and I who really spend time going through guidelines and spending time in the literature and trying to keep up for our patients, these decisions are very difficult, so, so how do we sort of include patients in that? What, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, the, there's an interesting history, I think, on the shared decision making because before you, uh, you and I became doctors, there was this very paternalistic approach, I think, that the doctors just said, you need to be on this, and there wasn't much discussion. And now I think there's so much information out there on the internet and patients are so aware that this or on TV, right? There's a lot of <laughs> Prodex and Eloquence ads on TV. No, I mean, well, our program, I mean. Even. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I really take that to heart. Actually, I, I, I've um, always felt I would try to uh, share the information I have with the patient. What are your thoughts about it? And you're right. Sometimes they'll say, you know, tell me what I should do. What's the best approach? I've had the other experience though, and I don't want to take too I, much time I, I, away I would from love the topic, to, no, but. Well, good. Um, just as an example, uh, a patient I just saw in the hospital yesterday who had a stroke, her third or fourth stroke, and her CHADS 2 score is a 4 or a 5, so she's way up there way in risk. High. And I said, you know, let's talk, let's have another discussion about being on a blood thinner because we had it in the office and you said you didn't want to. And, she, and then she had a stroke. But now you've had another stroke, which is like your third or fourth stroke. Have you changed your mind about that? Um, so that was sort of a shared decision making, and I was unhappy that she said, no, I, I just don't want anything. I don't want to be on a blood thinner. I just, just don't want that. And okay. So we had some shared decision making. It wasn't the outcome that I wanted, but we had, we had the discussion. So I think having the discussion is good. Some patients will look to us for guidance and say, you know, Doc, what should I do? Right. I, I, it's another topic for another day, but I'd like to actually review the shared decision making with our audience at some time in the future because... In that circumstance where the patient is at such a high risk, how much should we as clinicians press? Because mm -hmm. maybe the patient has some kind of misunderstanding why she doesn't want to have right. a blood thinner. But then if I do try to probe that to try to make sure there's clarity, it looks like I'm pushing for an outcome right. versus trying to do the right thing. And to, you know, because we, we feel bad when our patients have stroke. It's terrible. Yeah, it's so. a difficult position to be in. So just to move on, uh, the, an, another point, I'm trying to get through a few of the points here. So another point that was an emphasis, is a long time emphasis of mine with my patients, is that there's no benefit from aspirin. It just, aspirin doesn't work, and I send this, say this to my patients. When I say to patients, really, the recommendation, you have a high CHAD score like you did to your patient, you really should be on a blood thinner. A patient will say, no, well, I'm on an aspirin. And I have said there's no protection from an aspirin. Right. An aspirin does do some things, like prevents risk of arterial problems, like heart attacks, but does not prevent strokes from atrial fibrillation. So you can take it for other reasons, mm -hmm. but you can't assume it helps you for this problem. So exactly. I thought that was a great point of emphasis. The next topic is one that's really, again, requires a lot of thought, but there have been four studies of the new anticoagulation medicines that have been new alternatives to warfarin, mm -hmm. 50,000 patients in these trials. So really big trials that have really been great for yeah. us because we have a lot of information. These drugs are called Prodaxa, Xarelto, Eliquis, and the fourth drug is not yet on the market called Idoxaban. So these are the four drugs that we have or will have that are options to warfarin. And the guidelines go out of the way to say that these are good options, mm -hmm. but it's very careful not to say that they're preferred or better or superior. There are some different things. And what they recommend, and this is makes shared decision-making even more complicated, is, is that the doctor and the patient go through the pros and cons of these different drugs. Very difficult for us to do. Uh, I've spent you know, a lot of time in these programs individually dissecting these medicines, 30-minute programs. I've done blogs on the internet about these individual ones and making these decisions. It's very complicated. I think it's a reasonable recommendation, but practically it's very difficult. So I, any thoughts on that? I agree with how difficult that is because I think physicians themselves are still sorting out which one of these might be better for a particular patient. Um, you know, Zarelto is once a day, so if you have a patient who just you think is not going to do well with a twice a day medicine, that's probably the best choice. Um, if you have the highest concern about bleeding, Eliquis might be the best choice. But they're, they're, I think they're all good and they're all so close that it, 
that's a tough distinction to make. That's my thinking as well, just as you said. And uh, the, the, the important thing that you didn't say, which I know you think about, is which one the insurance company will cover for that particular patient. So it's really an important one. So uh, another top, topic that was covered in our new guidelines is the topic of rate control. Earlier I said the two main biggest issues with atrial fibrillation are that the heart goes very fast and the issue about stroke risk. So the blood thinning stroke risk is something we spent most of our time talking about, but the second thing is the rate control or speed of the heart. When the patient has this atrial fibrillation and there's a chaotic quivering of the heart, the heart tries to go very fast, 150, 160, 170 beats per minute. So the, the importance of controlling the speed of the heart is something that we, of course, focus on. And there are three main classes of medications that we use to control the speed of the heart. Beta-blocking type medicines like atenolol or metoprolol or toprol or carvedilol. Calcium channel blockers like cardizem or diltiazem or verapamil and digoxin. And what the guidelines have, again, emphasized, something we've heard in the past, is that we should be really very cautious with digoxin because that's a medicine that can accumulate in our older patients and can get such a high level in their blood seams that it can make their heart go dangerously slow. So we should really use caution with that. A second recommendation in the uh, issue with regard to controlling the speed of the heart is that we don't have to be that strict about controlling the speed of the heart. There have been a couple of clinical trials that have now said in the past uh, years ago, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, uh, Dr. Adams and I might really try to push patients down to a really almost normal heartbeat, like around 60 or 70, thinking that that was better for our patients. But the studies and the really importance of research is for us to understand if that was right. And studies looked at that strict kind of rate control versus just making sure the heart rate is less than 110. So not too fast, but not really worried about making it slow and normal. And we found that less than 110 is really good enough. Nothing bad really happens as long as it's less than 110 at rest and on, on average. So, so that's another thing that has been really emphasized in these new guidelines. And the last thing is there are patients who, despite our best efforts, can't tolerate the medicines or despite using a lot of medicines, still are going very fast and can't get less than, less than 110 or have frequent hospitalizations. This, in my experience, is often with older women, people in their ladies in their old uh, late 80s or early 90s. And these guidelines have really said that one thing that is now a recommendation to consider is a kind of pacemaker option called AV nodal ablation and pacing. This is something I've used infrequently, maybe two times a year I recommend this to be done by one of our electrophysiology colleagues where the uh, catheter is placed in and the heart is burned so that it won't go fast and then a pacemaker is implanted. And for almost all of the patients that I've recommended, they just love this procedure because they don't have to take medicines to slow their heart down and the hospitalizations just go away. So they just are dependent on the pacemaker to control the speed of the heart. So, so I was very happy that these guidelines have now said that this is a legitimate recommendation, something that we've been doing for some time. And the last thing is uh, the issue about rhythm control. And the issue about rhythm control is I've been talking mostly about leaving patients in the atrial fibrillation but controlling the speed of the heart, but the topic of rhythm control, actually trying to get the patients back into heart rhythm, back into a normal heart rhythm, was, was discussed as one that is, again, very wide open, that we should be very individualistic in our approach, that we should use medicines very cautiously because these medicines are at high risk, that we should use this shocking treatment called cardioversion with caution, but that with all of these things, that they should be really individualized with regard to their treatment uh, for using these rhythm control medications. And that for a lot of patients, they do very well if we just use the rate controlling type strategy where we slow down the heart and give them the blood thinning medicines to protect them from a stroke. Uh, do they, I know this is a little bit off topic, but uh, some patients will say, well, I, I have an artificial valve, and um, uh, I know that there's these blood thinners out there. Could I just take one of those? Because Coumadin's more difficult to use. So, so that was that topic again on the non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Any patient who has had any valve replacement or even a repair of a heart valve, some of our patients have a mitral valve that can actually be fixed up, but they don't get a replacement. They actually included that as a valvular circumstance. So those patients would not have non-valvular atrial fibrillation. So therefore, warfarin would be the only recommendation. Right, right exactly. And the valvular, uh, and the other question that, that comes up that's a, a, a similar question to the one that you ask is, at the for the time being, there's no opportunity to use these new blood thinning medicines for v patients who have heart valves themselves, right. separate from atrial fibrillation. One trial was done and showed it to be inferior 
to Coumadin. So for the time being, we have to wait and see on that. Right, right. That'll be a, a whole new frontier if those Certainly. one of those medications gets approved for artificial valves. Exactly right. Um, and some of those medicines have actually been approved for you know pulmonary embolus, blood clots in the lung, or blood clots in the leg, which is a nice indication. Yes, we do have some expanding indications, as you said, for, for prophylaxis after an orthopedic surgery, like a knee or a hip replacement. We have a, a indication for, as you said, pulmonary embolism or a clot in the lungs or in the thighs. Uh, but uh, as, as of now, from a strictly heart standpoint, it's limited to atrial fibrillation. Yeah. I, I mean, that was a great review of the new guidelines, because I think you touched on a lot of points that we talk about with patients every day in the office. It seems sometimes that the atrial fibrillation is just in the water. You know, we see so many patients with that. And so this, this is a great background for those discussions. Yeah, so these guidelines are a 127-page document I tried to summarize for our audience for the high key points of thir of in our 30 minutes together. But I, I would say that uh, I think that they've, they've helped clarify some areas of uncertainty. I don't think that they're shocking, but for you and I to be able to solidly say to our patients, look, the, the best, best consensus view amongst these three major American yeah. cardiology societies are been codified in this document that you and I can sort of now point to and say, look, this is the best way we should take care of you. And uh, you share decision making, which uh, is, a, is another topic for another day, which is a, a very difficult thing in a topic as complex as this. Yeah, very interesting. I guess the one other patient that's popping into my mind is the patient that has a high CHADS2 score, so they're at risk for blood clots. And we'd love to put them on a blood thinner, but they've fallen several times, they have terrible balance, they've fallen and hit their head and we're so worried about bleeding that we, we say, you know what, it's just not safe. So we have to bite the bullet sometimes and, and not put them on a blood thinner. Those are difficult decisions. I think those are difficult decisions. As I said, there are some scores. There's a, a score called the has bled score. And the, the reason why I mention it is not for anybody to know about it, but the thing that's concerning for doctors like us is that many of the components of the has blood score, meaning that you have a high risk for bleeding, are the same ones that are in the CHADS VASC score. So if you are older age, uh, you're on certain medicines like aspirin that are used for arterial problems, your score goes up for bleeding, but it also goes up for stroke. So the, the, the benefits and the risks go up with both. So it can be a very complicated right. decision. But people have, have discussed the issue about uh, hazard related to falling. Mm -hmm. And there's been some studies that have shown that many times the concern that people might be unstable has really been led to many physicians to be more conservative than they should be. I don't know if, if that's your view, but I'm not talking about a patient who has repeatedly fallen, right. say, bled into their brain or had serious falling issues. But sometimes I think that, that my agreement with the studies have shown that a patient who looks a little bit unsteady, maybe walks with a walker, and the, the medical doctor, the primary care doctor, or the cardiologist will say, oh, well, they're unsteady, they can't do it. Right. And I guess that would be a definite point for shared decision making because that patient may be unsteady now, but if they have a stroke, they may be, frankly, bedridden. So they may decide right. that I'm willing to accept a bleeding consequence for reducing the risk of a stroke. I guess that's the... Yeah, the, that's a good way to look at it. So. Well, that's been, a, that's been a great review. Uh, those guidelines are very complex, very long, very detailed, and uh, that was a terrific review for our, for our audience. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and uh, in conclusion, I'm uh, Dr. Kenneth Adams with uh, Pentucket Medical Associates. I've been here with Dr. Seth Bilizarian, who's given us an excellent review of the new atrial fibrillation guidelines. Uh, this show is presented by uh, Haverhill, Community TV, Haverhill Community TV and Pentucket Medical Associates. Thank, thank you very much for watching.